السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, Someone uh, left his phone Whose phone is this? It's Blackberry Okay, so Huh? Oh, okay It has no value? So no one wants to come and take it أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين and let's leave this uh, um, chairs here for for the ladies so we can uh, leave this uh, place for them if they want to uh, come and join Inshallah, um, today we will talk about al-wudu. We, uh, as we mentioned before, we always talk about al-tahara before we t- before we talk about al-salah. Um, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Inna Allah yuhibbu al-tawabin wa yuhibbu al-mutatahirin." And we talked about uh, al-hadath and al-khabath, and we said that al-khabath is the najasa itself that has to be removed. But al-hadath is um, a ritual status um, that's, that's not physical impurity there. Um, so in order for us to be able to pray, then we have to remove this hadath. And we mentioned also briefly before that the hadath are two kinds of hadath. Uh, hadath asghar and hadath akbar. Hadath asghar means the minor hadath. And the al-hadath al-akbar is the major hadath. And as I said before, hadath means that the status in which we cannot pray or touch the mushaf, as we will say, as we will see in the future, inshallah. So we have to remove this hadath before we start our prayer. Um, hadath al-Akbar mainly, mainly refers to janaba. Um, if someone gets junub, then he has to take a shower to, to remove this hadath akbar, the major hadath. Or in the uh, case of uh, menstruation, when it ends, and also the post-birth um, bleeding or cold nifas, when this happens, then in order for ladies to be able to pray and to do uh, the regular religious activities, then they have to take shower. So this taking shower removes al-hadath al-akbar. So wudu is basically uh, has been uh, prescribed for us to remove al-hadath al-azhar, to remove the minor hadath, right? And the minor hadath is everything that nullify the wudu or break the wudu, right? So if you have wudu and you want to uh, sleep deeply, then you wake up, then you, ca- you, ha- you cannot pray unless you remove this hadath. So while you're asleep, there could be uh, gas passed by or there could be nothing. And th- that's why the ulama talked about sleeping. Is it sleeping itself that breaks the wudu? Or what might happen while we are sleeping that breaks the wudu? Uh, and th- we'll talk about this when we talk about uh, what nullifies the wudu. So now, if you wake up in the morning, then maybe you are uh, physically so clean, but you cannot pray. Why? Because it's hadath. Right? To remove this hadath, you need to simply make wudu. This is what we are talking about today, inshallah. And then we'll talk about the ghusl and what is the hadath akbar and what necessitates ghusl and how to, to do ghusl and all these things, inshallah, when we finish talking about wudu. Um, Al wudu, of course, is mentioned in Al Quran. There's no difference um, in opinions in this. There's ijma, consensus um, among all Muslim scholars, uh, mujtahideen, and and غير مجتهدين all Muslim madhahib they agree that one cannot pray until he or she remove the hadith or make wudu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear in Surah Al-Ma'idah and this is one of the things that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made it very clear so that there's no room for any dispute right if someone claim that wudu is not important then um uh, we were talking interfaith now, not intrafaith, right? Just to put it simple. This is an ijma. Allah said it, the Prophet said it, all um Muslim ummah agree on it, so there's no way to have any um, uh, doubt 
whether wudu is obligatory or not. All right. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said in Surah Al Maida, um, chapter number five, verse num number six: Ya yeah, yuhal ladina amanu idha qumtum ila salat, faqsiru wujuhakum, iqsiru wujuhakum, wa idiyakum ila al-marafiq, umsahu biruusikum, wa arjulakum ila al-kaabain. Four things. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, when you rise for prayer, then you have to do these four things: to wash your face and to wash your hands up to the elbows, and then wipe on your head and wash your feet. Four things, right? And so, and this command, as we mentioned last week, the command sometimes refer to obligatory act and sometimes it, it shows that it is only recommended or it is permissible, right? These three levels we talked about last time. So um, here it's a clear command um, and it is, it is wajib. Uh, there's no doubt that Allah wants us to do that. And in the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said hadith in Bukhari and Muslim Abu Dawood at Tirmidhi. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that Allah does not accept the prayer of one who nullified his ablution or wudu until he performs it again. So every time we lose our wudu, then we have to do it again. Otherwise, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam clearly said Allah does not accept a prayer without wudu. Is there any exception? Of course, there are exceptions that we'll talk about it later on. But this is the rule, that um, if you are healthy, the water is available, then you have to make wudu before salah. Um, and as I mentioned, consensus is considered a third uh, dalil um, that uh, all Muslim scholars agree that it's a must, um, you know, unless the, you cannot, this different story we'll also talk about uh, later, inshallah. So there's no doubt that wudu is, is, a, is a fard, it's a wajib. I will talk, there are different meanings of these terms, but it is obligatory. And if one intentionally prayed without wudu, then uh, this is, salah is not, uh, is not considered uh, valid at all. But before we talk about the technicalities of wudu, it's always good to talk about the virtues of wudu. Uh, again, uh, we need to know why, not only how, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to practice this wudu, which to some, and in some circumstances, is even more difficult than, than the prayer itself. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, At-tahoor shatr al-iman. At-tahoor shatr, shatr means half. At-tahoor shatr al-iman. What does this mean? What does this mean? Half of the Iman? It's, isn't it too much? Um, no, but Rasulullah said that. At-Tahur Shatru Al-Iman, the very famous hadith. At-Tahur Shatru Al-Iman. It's a statement of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And because Tahur, you know, involved so many activities, which, whether internal or external. Because Iman is something that we do outward, like praying and um, zakah and so on. And there are activities we do inside. And we need to purify our niyyah before we do any act, right? And we need to purify our, ourselves externally before we pray, before we do tawaf, right? And, and so on. So, at-tahuru shatru al-iman, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. This is something we need to keep in mind when we go and make wudu, right? This is half of our iman. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wants us to be clean ummah. Clean from inside and clean from outside. There are plenty of ahadith about the virtues of wudu. I will just mention some of them, not all of them. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked his companions one day. This is one way of conveying an important message. Afala adullukum ala ma yamhullahu bil khataya wa arfa bi darajat. Simple question. Shall I not? inform you of an act by which Allah erases sins and raises degrees. It's a huge thing. A huge thing. For your sins to be you know, removed and for you to go upper in, in, in ranks, or in degrees, up in the heaven. They said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, tell us what it is. And I'm sure many of them were thinking about jihad and spending and doing big, big things. But Rasulullah um, amazingly, mentioned three things that it's very simple for anybody to do. But we don't pay attention to the significance of these acts. 
He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, number one, qala isbaagh wudu'i ala al makari, or perfecting wudu under difficult circumstances. This is the number one. Three things he mentioned. Isbaagh. Isbaagh coming from the word sabagha or sabigh uh, w- for the things that covers everything. So when you have clothes that sabigh that covers every part of you. If you have a coat that sabigh that covers most of your body. Right? So isbaagh al wudu means to cover the areas that should be covered or wash these parts perfectly. So isbaagh al wudu isbaagh al wudu means to perfect your wudu despite the fact it's difficult. Now, alhamdulillah, most of us, if not all of us, have you know, hot and cold water. So, but millions of people, Muslims around the world, they don't have this privilege, right? They have only cold water if they have any water, right? If they have any water. And this winter, they wake up in the morning and they make wudu with this cold water, right? So this is the only, it's very difficult for them to warm up water every time they want to pray. So when it's really cold, when we're traveling, when we are uh, sometimes in the workplace, it's not very convenient for people to make wudu. So it's bad wudu to perfect your wudu despite the difficulties. This is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates so much. That when we wake up in the morning, still cold and want to make wudu and make it perfect not just uh, you know um, superficial imperfect um, incomplete wudu no. we perfect it despite the difficulty and this is something we need to actually convey to our children who usually or most of the time they their wudu is maybe one tenth of the wudu right so they do it very quickly very fast they just want to get it done they don't like to do it um, so we need to convey this to them that isbaagh al al makari is one of the acts through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala erases our sins and increase us in degrees and number two qala wa kathratul khuta ila al masajid taking many steps to the masjid and this is something we need to really think about very seriously we all want to be wealthier right want to make more money and if you want to make more hasanat, this is the simple way to drive to the masjid, right? I don't know how to count steps when you're driving, um, but uh, maybe every round of tire that counts as a step, Allah Adam. But every step you take from your home to the masjid, whether you're driving or riding or walking, this is how in other hadith, every step you take towards the masjid, then one step with one step, Allah erases one sayyi'ah or bad deeds, and with one other step, you get one hasana. So every step you take to the masjid, this is something that we, we need to uh, take seriously. That, that uh, especially, of course, if it's difficult, if it's like cold or in the morning, early in the morning or late at night, like um, when it's very early in the morning in the summertime, Fajr is very early and Isha is very late, so. So isbaag al wudu'i al makari. Kathrat al khuta il masajid wa antidhar al salat ba'd al salat. To wait for the salah after the next prayer. Um, this does not mean that you stay in the masjid all the time, but antidhar al salah does not mean that, that you have to wait physically in the masjid. But if you do that, like if you pray Maghrib, this, this dars, for example, in the summertime, we do it after Maghrib. So we pray Maghrib, we sit until Isha. So we are waiting for Salat al Isha, technically. But also this includes intidharu salah You are waiting for the next prayer Wherever you are But you, are, you have in mind You are preparing yourself Your schedule That you are going to pray For the next salah So waiting for the salah Or planning to pray next salah Is um, The Rasulullah sallallahu said فَذَلِكُمْ الْرِبَاطِ Al-ribat means Ribat fi sabillah Literally means that you are in jihad fi sabillah And you are hold, holding your weapon And Waiting for your enemies, right? So this is ribat, ribatun fi sabilillah. Um, Anas radiallahu anhu said that if a person pu- uh, purifies himself f- for prayer and make make wudu, <coughs> he um, Allah subhanahu wa taala expiates all of his sins, and his prayer is considered an extra reward for him. Nafl. So in other hadith, Rasulullah explained in details how the sins 
drop from our body as the water drop from our body. So when, when, when we wash our face, sins we commit with our eyes or our tongue is washed away when we w w w wash our face. When we wash our hands, the sins committed by our hands it drops uh, down with, with the water uh, to the point where Rasulullah said that the sins even go from under his um, uh, fingernails. So, so when we finish our wudu, then all the sins have been erased. And when we go to the salah, this is nafl, this is extra. So the salah, before we start the salah, the dhunub, the um, bad deeds are erased when we um, do wudu. In the famous hadith, uh, when Rasulullah went to the a graveyard to visit um, his Sahaba and, and he said I wish I've seen my brothers they said Ya Rasulullah are we not your brothers he said you are my companions Antum Ashabi, but my brothers are those who will come after me how would you recognize them in the day of judgment Ya Rasulullah he said that's very easy very simple it's like someone um, who has uh, horses that has uh, have white marks on their face and on their um, uh, on their feet and they are mixed with other horses who are totally black. Um, would it be easy for him to recognize his horses? He said, yeah, of course. He said, similarly, I will see or I will, I will recognize my people on the Day of Judgment because they will come with shining faces, hands, and, and legs. Because of the wudu. So keep this in mind. Every time we wash our face, we are adding more light to our face in the Day of Judgment. That's why it is part of the sunan, the adab of wudu, to increase the area of wudu. So if you are washing your hand up to the elbow, if you want to make it even higher, that's extra. So the wudu or the hilya, the light in the Day of Judgment, will reach as far as your wudu reach. Similarly, when you wash your feet, then it's up to the ankle, but if you want to make it up to half of your leg or more, then the light in the Day of Judgment will be up to this point. <clears throat> now, uh, let's talk now about the obligatory acts of, of, of al-wudu. Al al it's very interesting that uh, when, when you read about fiqh al-wudu al in the four madhahib, you, you, you'll find similarities and differences, of course. Uh, one of the similarities is that they all agree that the four things mentioned in the ayah are obligatory. It's the fara'id al-wudu. There are obligatory acts. Um, some ulama call it arkan, others call it fara'id, the plural of farida. Farida is singular and fara'id are, are the, the plural. Um, in other words, these are the acts if you miss one of them, then the entire wudu is invalid. All right, so we have to pay so much attention to it. In the Hanafi Madhab, in particular, there is another level that co they call it wajib, or they have another name called Sunnah Muakkada. Sunnah Muakkada means it's wajib, and wajib means it's not as fard, but it's not also uh, nafl. In other words, you will be blamed if you don't do it. Why? Because it, it, it did not come through um, an ayah of Quran or a, a mutawatir hadith or mashhur hadith. In other words, if the dalil or if the act itself did not come to us through Quran, which is very authentic, or hadith that's extremely authentic, and these are the highest level of authenticity called mutawatir or mashhur, then if it comes in Bukhari and Muslim, but it's not mutawatir, it's not mashhur, this means that it's wajib, not fard. Like Salat al-Witr, for example. Witr in Hanafi Madhab is wajib. You will be blamed if you, if you don't uh, uh, practice. But it's not fard, it's not like the five prayers. Right? Um, so that practically, both of them must be done. But theoretically, the fard is higher than wajib because it came through the Quran or the very, very authentic hadith. All right? So the obligatory acts, according to Hanafi Madhab, there are only four. Simply what mentioned the Quran. These four things. Washing face, hands up to the elbow, wiping on the head, 
and washing the feet. Easy and simple. If you do these four things, even without following the order that we used to do, then your wudu is okay, you're good. You can pray with this wudu, right? This is not to say that, it, it, you know, following the order or not following it are the same. It's always sunnah, it's better to follow the order. But the obligatory act of salah or of, of wudu based on the Hanafi madhab are four, only four, right? According to Imam al Shafi'i, they are six. He added two more things. He added niyyah in the beginning. You have to have niyyah. This is the niyyah of wudu or niyyah of raf'u al hadath, right? To be able to pray. You have to have this niyyah. So, based on this difference, according to Hanafi, if you in the summertime you play your whatever game you play and you go just wash your you know face and you wash your hand you you did everything that the ayah said and then you have no intention that you are making wudu so now when you or when you when you do this can you pray with this wash yes according to hanafi yes according to shafi no you cannot do that and by the way this is the also the opinion of imam malik and imam abu hanifa so he added the niyyah in the beginning and he added something else that's not mentioned this ayah he added what he called a tartib the sequence you have to do this this way you cannot start with your feet and then wash your face and then you have to if you if you missed this order then the entire wudu is is gone imam uh, ahmad ibn hanbal almost the same as Imam Shafi'i. Imam Malik considered them seven things. So he added one more thing. He added a tadlik or rubbing the area. So it's not enough to just put a little water pour on your on your on your hand line. You have to, you have to with the other hand wash these parts. So it's not only enough to just throw water on your face or on your hand on your feet. That's, you see some people sometimes they just put their feet like this under the faucet. According to my Malik that's not enough. No, that's that's not wudu. This is you can call it anything else. So now we know there are four, six, or seven. Right? And Imam Malik also uh, one of the differences between Imam Malik and Imam Shafi is that he considered something called al muala Al muala means to make sure that you don't leave a big time gap between washing one part of your body and the other. So in other words, if you are making wudu, you wash your face and you got a phone call, you went to make the phone call and it took, <laughs> it took 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, or, or you get one of these so many notifications that comes to you from your whatever smartphone or tablet whatever and you go and you find you know an email or you found something in your Facebook you follow it then you go back to continue wudu should you start from the beginning or continue according to Imam Malik no if there's a big gap right that uh, in between you have done something that has nothing to do with wudu then you have to start from the beginning this is this is unique to Imam Malik. So these two things are unique to Imam Malik: the the, the mu'ala, that you don't leave big gap. You have to do it one after the other, unless there's something reasonable. Reasonable, yani, you know, you just went to get something and came back, then you continue. But if you leave a lo long period of time, then you you have to start all over. So this uh, mu'ala, mu'ala means one after the other, and the tadliq. Tadlik, tadlik, um, I mean rubbing, you know, things with with your hand, you, the the part that you are you are you are washing. Um, according to Mother um, Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu, who said that this is what Allah subhanahu wa taala said. If, if niya was must, then Allah would have mentioned. Allah would have said, get your niya and do these things. And if the tartib is one of the obligatory acts of wudu, Allah would have mentioned it. So it's not mentioned. Allah said, do these four things. If you do only these four things, you are fine. But it's always good to have the niyyah, and it's always good to keep the order. Right? The Imam al-Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad, and others who said that this tartib 
let's start with the niyyah first. The niyyah, they said, no, niyyah is not mentioned in the ayah, but it's mentioned in, in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he said, And this applies to every act of worship. Every act of ibadah. This, they said, this is one, one quarter of, of, the, of the sunnah. This hadith. Deeds are by intentions. So, this applies to everything you do. If you give someone money to help him, a poor person who needs money, you give it to him. And you have no intention, that's zakah money. Just give it to him as a gift. Halas, that's not zakah money. If you have the intention of zakah, then this counts as zakah. What is the difference? The niyyah. Right? And I've been asked this question so many times. I give, I spend so much, you know, sadaqah, general meaning. Does this count for zakat? What is your intention? Now my intention was, there's no, there was no intention. Just these people need money, I give them money. Now it's inshallah we'll get the reward, but this does not count as zakat. Zakat needs ni. So everything needs ni. Um, and if you read anything, any chapter in fiqh, when you talk about as siyam for example, fasting, niyyah, you have to have niyyah, right? So, what is niyyah? How, how do we have to say it? Or it's something in our heart? Some ulama say that you don't have to say anything. It's, it's in your heart. Others said no. It's better to, if you have doubt, then you always good to say it, and so on. But their argument, see, now, now maybe you have an idea about how ulama have different opinions. Imam al-Shafi said no. Everything needs intention. Everything. And you have no intention, this does not count. Right? And as for the tartib or the sequence, keeping the sequence, um, it's not mentioned in the Quran, but they have, see, the adilla or the dalil, the textual dalil, the dalil that's within the text itself, or external, could be a dalil that comes out of the text, another the rational dalil. Right? So Imam al-Shafi'i and, and Imam Malik and Ahmad, they said, no, tartib is obligatory. Uh, and you have to do in this order. So where do you get this from? The Quran did not say that. No, the Quran said, where, where is it? And this gives you an idea about how ulama read the same text differently. They said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, wash your face, wash your hand, and then wipe on your head and then wash so two things washing and wiping right so said what's the point then wash 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 uh, sorry wash wash wipe wash so there must be a point and they said this is the uh, conventional meaning or this is the conventional usage of Arabic language. Arabs, when they speak, they don't separate between similar things unless there's a, a reason. Allah could have said, wash these three things and wipe your, 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 your head. اغسلوا وجوهكم Wash your face, wash your hand, wash your feet, and wipe on your head. But this separation between washing and placing, wiping your head in, in, in between, this means do it this way, <laughs> right? Because normally we keep the similar things together, right? So they extracted from this that this order is important. Additionally, they said this is how all the hadith that describe the wudu of Rasulullah described this way. So now you have two evidences actually, and both are textual evidence. Right? It came from the text itself. No, nothing came from outside. So therefore, they think these two arguments are based on these two arguments. They said, well, then following this order is a must. And if you play with this order, then this does not count. The Hanafi scholars also, they are smart. They are not that, you know, they know how to respond, Yani. And they said, well, the order is Sunnah. Yes, the pro when the Prophet does something, this does not mean necessarily that it's obligatory to do it this way all the time. You get this point? So when Rasulullah does something regularly, this does not mean necessarily that it is obligatory. So Rasulullah prays Qiyamul Layl every night. Didn't he? He used to pray Qiyam every night. 
Does this mean it's obligatory? No. In fact, Rasulullah used to leave many acts that he likes to do because he was concerned or afraid that people consider it obligatory. And the ulama calls it as sunnan at tarqiyya Rasulullah left something intentionally to make the point. That's not fard. And the best example is Salat al Taraweeh. Right? He, did, he prayed one night and two nights, and then when he saw people waiting for him, he said, No, no, no. He used to pray Asha and go home and pray at home. And when they asked him about this, he said, I'm afraid that people will, consider, will take it as fard. And I don't want to make things difficult for people. Right? Um, so, then, then yes, Rasulullah did, and it's Sunnah, it's highly recommended to do this order. But this is not to say that if you change the order, your wudu is invalid. Now, it's still valid, but you violated the order, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But we still believe that it's only for um, obligatory things. So, um, and I found this actually useful sometimes, you know, when... when um, <laughs> sometimes when you make wudu, and you know, when you finish your wudu, you see dry part in your arm, especially this area here, right? Oh my God! Then based in, 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 in Hanafi and uh, sorry in, in Shafi and Hanbali, then you have to oh everything must be redone because if you go just and wash your hand, this means that you change the order, right? According to Abu Hanifa, if you go and wash this part only, you are fine because the order is not important, right? So. I'll leave it up to you, so decide on this. So, um, this is um, simply the, the obligatory act of, of, um, uh, of wudu. And um, washing the face is the first thing that the Quran mentioned. فَغْسِرُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ إِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَغْسِرُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ إِغْسِرُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ Wash your face, wash your face. Easy and simple. But the ulama, of course, as I said before, Fiqh is, 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 is law, right? And the job of the lawmakers or the legislators or, or the fuqaha or the jurists is to set the limits. This is the limit, right? And they explain it. And if you read the books of, of Fiqh, you really, you'll be amazed at how these people were... This is their, their life. This is what they do all the time. And all of them start very young. And they have the time and the need to discuss these things because they're jurists. So what is the face? And would this include the ears or not? And you'll be surprised to know that according to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, um, wash, uh, washing the, 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 they consider the ears to be part of the head, not part of the face. Because Allah said, wash your face and wipe your head. So. If you consider the ears part of your face, then you have to wash your, your ears, right? But if you consider your ears part of your head, not of your face, I'm serious. So because Allah said, wash your face and wipe on your head. So what do you think about this? Should we wash our ears or wipe on them? Why? So this, this means that, you, oh, you are, you are saying what you do. <laughs> no, logically, no. Do you think your ears are part of your face or part of your head? Huh? Head? Okay. So, some said no. No, the ears are part of your face. Do we need to have doctors here to tell us? No, it's a common sense. And But they always go back to the Quran and the Sunnah. And... They said, well, because Allah, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, when he made dua, uh, when he makes uh, dua, he prays Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, الذي خلق سجد وجهه للذي خلقه وصوره فشق سمعه وبصره. My face makes a jude to the one who created it, and he placed the hearing and the seeing in it. Oh, okay, the hearing is part of the face, according to this dua. Right? So... Yeah, you have to wash your ears, man. <laughs> and the other said, no, it's part of your, of your head. So therefore, when you wipe on your head, then, then you need to wipe only, not to wash. Because wash means literally to get water and 
wash your ears, which is really difficult to do, right? So according to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and others, they used, and they also quoted another hadith that described the wudu of Rasulullah sallallahu and they said that when he wiped his, his uh, head, then he used these um, uh, fingers to um, uh, wipe the, 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 the inner part and these two to do the back of the ear. So every madhab has its own dalil, and we'll talk about this when we talk about washing um, or the sunan acts. So, فَغَصِّلُوا وَجْوَاكُمْ They say the waj, the, the waj start from here, from where your hair starts. All right? So, what if there's no hair? Okay, it's a legitimate question. They said the face started from where the hair usually begins. So the, the hair begins here, right? So you consider this is the beginning of it, even if you don't have hair. Because sometimes people don't have hair or they have hair up to here. It happens sometimes. So they also have extra hair that goes down here. They have to wash this part, although it's covered with hair. So whether you have extra hair or you have no hair, then you go with the normal place where you, the hair starts, right? Or remember when you were 16, right? Get a picture and find out when your face starts. So this is the place where I used to have hair. So this is the beginning of the, the hair. And the other um, um, two limits of the hair, they said the beginning of your ears. Those who said that it's, it's not, then therefore this, this is yani, from this point to this point. Okay, so these are the limits of this. How about this area here under your jaw? Would it be considered part of the hair or not? Oh, of the face or not? What do you think? Is it? Okay, some ulama said it is. Others said, in Hanafi mother, for example, they said, no, it's not part. If it's enough to wash your, because this is, these are the limits of the face. Okay, so this is not included. This part, the lower part here is not included, right? But Imam Shafi and others said, no, this is part of your face, <laughs> right? So you have, that, that's, that's really very interesting to know. And they, to, in order to make their point, it is part or not, they go and find a hadith and find an ayah or find any logical or rational evidence. This is part of your ayah. Therefore, Allah did, subhanahu wa ta'ala could have, could have said that this is the limit of your face. But there's no hadith that says whether this part below your jaw is part of it or not. So it's always good to make sure that this also is, is, is covered, this part under your jaw. Um, does this include washing the inner part of our nose? You have to get the water inside because this part of the face. No, you don't have to do that. So when you wash your face, that this extra, uh, external part of, of the nose that uh, must be touched by the water, but the inner part is a sunnah to rinse. We'll talk about it later, but you don't have to do that. Some even exaggerate because they consider the, the eye is part of it. Abdullah ibn Omar used to get the water inside of his eyes because Allah said, wash your face. And this part of our face that, that must be washed. He turned blind later on. Rahimahullah wa So you don't have to let the water get inside of your, of your eyes. Um, what else about the face? Um, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, then wash your hands up to the elbows. Okay? It's very important to make sure that this part, this area here, it's part, this is the elbow. Yeah, so this is always, always, we forget. We wash, and this area, you need really to follow Imam Malik in this and make sure that you touch this place. Otherwise, m most of the time it will be dry, and you'll find out later on. And if you're ha if you are not Hanafi, you are in trouble, right? You have to start all over, right? So make sure that up to the elbow. So is it? It's, it's always sunnah to increase to make sure that is well covered and beyond, right? But if you wash up to this area here, that that will be enough, right? Um, whether in the, in the winter or the summer, people usually leave this part um, dry up to the elbow. 
it's sunnah to start with the right hand and then um, the left hand, but this, it's not obligatory. It's always sunnah to start with the right. Then the masah comes after this. Masah mas is different from ghasl. Ghasl wash means that you, you, you put water on the place, but masah merely just getting your hand water, uh, wet, and then wipe on your head. Do you have to wipe the entire head, part of the head, another disagreement? Because, again, the ayah says, وَمْسَحُوا did not say, إِمْسَحُوا رُؤُسَكُمْ if it said imsahu ru'usakum, then this clearly means that all your head. Imsahu ru'usakum. But it says imsahu bi ru'usikum. And the ba, ba here, it can serve the number of reasons. It could be, usually, it could be ba za'ida, it could be ya li tab'eed. Tab'eed, tab'eed means ba'd. Ba'd means part or some. Okay? Fa'msahu bi ru'usikum. So Imam al-Shafi'i said, بِرُؤُسِكُمْ Allah, if Allah wants us to wipe all our head, he could have said, فَمْسَحُوا رُؤُسَكُمْ Okay? But it's فعل مَفْعُولٌ بِهِ مَنْصُوبٌ مَفْعُولٌ بِهِ مَمْسَحُوا رُؤُسَكُمْ But here it says, مَمْسَحُوا بِرُؤُسِكُمْ So it's مَجْرُور اسم مَجْرُور بحرف الجر حرف الجر با ورؤوس اسم مَجْرُور وَكُمْ مضاف إليه so the point here is Imam Shafi'i and others said no, if you wipe any part, any part, you just get some water and do just like this. That's fine. That that you did mess. Right? Um uh, Imam Malik said no, you have to wipe the uh, Imam Malik and Imam Ahmad. They said you have to wipe all of it. Why? Because this is what Allah said, number one, number two, this is what the Prophet said. Again, all a hadith that describe the wudu of Rasulullah they said that when it comes to wiping the head, one of three things. One is that he wipes the entire head back and forth. So he, his hand gets wet and then he goes from the beginning all the way to the end and then comes back. Right? Sometimes he, sallallahu alayhi wa he um, uh, wear this uh, turban, so he wipes on the turban, not on his head. We'll talk about this and wiping on the socks because, I mean, but not today, next time. Yeah, very important, I know. And the third time, when the, he saw, saw Allah some, sometimes, he wipes the uh, front part of his head when the imam is like this, so he wipes on this and on the turban as well. So part of his head and the rest of the turban. So they said that you have to do it, all, all of it, not part of it. Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu, he is with the opinion, he's like Imam Shafi'i, but he said at least one quarter. And how to count this, he said the, the size of your palm. So if you get this wet and you wipe like this, that, that will be sufficient. This is the minimum. According to Imam Shafi'i, any part, even with two fingers, some, some of them said that would. You have like this, that, that would be sufficient. Um, so, if you have the chance to do all of it, to be in the safe side, that would be even better, right? But if you missed part of it or some of your hair, you know, again, sometimes people have a lot of doubt and they, they doubt whether their wudu is correct or not. If they missed, you know, some of their hair not touched by the water. That's, that's not, um, should not be a big concern. It's always good to aim to wipe all your head if you can. Alright? وَمْسَحُوا بِرُؤُسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ And what's الْكَعْبَيْنِ? These two bones that we call the ankle. Right? So, this must be washed. And again, according to Imam Malik, then you have to wash and you have to rub your skin. And it's also important to say that you need to make sure that water goes through your toes. Okay, so not only the upper part, but in between. That's called takhleel. Takhleel is, means that you let the water go through your, your fingers. Okay, so the upper part, it goes up to the ankle. And if you can make it higher, that would be even better. And uh, on the end of uh, your foot, then make sure that water goes through the uh, the toes again uh, 
Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu said that keeping this order is a must. Um, um, and Imam Malik said al muwala is important. And what is, what is the, 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 the criteria for this muwala? In other words, not to leave a big gap. They said that if the last part you're, uh, you have washed dried up in normal weather, this is a sign that you have taken so long, then you have to start all over. Okay, so if you, are, if you washed your face and then you went to answer the phone, and by the time you went back, then your face is dried normally or naturally, this means that that was too long, then you have to start all over, according to Mam Malik, right? Uh, it makes sense, I mean, you have to have a criteria. So, so what's the criteria? Sometimes there's no criteria, there's no standard. What constitute long or short? We don't know. So the fuqaha come up with a reasonable measure or a sign that, 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 that indicates that that way is beyond the reasonable. So you have to start all over. I will stop here. And inshallah, next week we'll talk about the sunan and the nawafil. Before I uh, conclude, I just want to mention one of the great hadith that I always encourage you to keep in mind when we make wudu. When we are done, Rasulullah said that when you perfect your wudu and you say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika lahu, Ashadu anna Muhammadan abdu wa rasuluh, all eight gates of Jannah will be open for you. Right? So, to enter from each one you, you like. So we always need to keep this um, dua when we finish our <coughs> our wudu, <coughs> and we need to uh, take wudu seriously and consider it part of ibadah. It's part of our ibadah that purifies us from outside and from inside as well. Um, this is time for questions related to this uh, part, and next time, inshallah, we'll talk about the sunan and adab, and we'll talk also about. Uh, permissibility or impermissibility of wiping on the socks or, or the leather socks or whatever. <clears throat> yes? About the niya, when you're doing the wudu or when you're saying the namaz at the same time, you're doing the wudu because you want to say the prayer. Mm -hmm. And you're saying the prayer because you had all the intention to come to play. Khalas, this is the good, good enough for intention. Enough. Yeah. The one difference is between Hanafi and Shafi'i in this that um, Imam Abu Hanifa uh, said that you can make the intention ahead of your wudu. So our sitting now, uh, you know, Isha will be in half an hour. And so you say, yeah, inshallah, we'll go and make wudu before Isha. There's a big gap between the niyyah and the actual wudu. That's okay. According to Imam Shafi'i, no. You have to do the intention right before you start your, the first act of your, of your rule. Some slight differences here and there, but uh, that uh, is what's in your heart. What's in your heart? What, what, what do you do? So in fasting Ramadan, you wake up to eat suhoor. Why are you doing that? Because the niyyah of siyam. So this is an indication that you have the niyyah. The niyyah is the intention. Why you are doing this? Sometimes. Yeah, we'll talk about this next week. Do you want to get everything in one week? Uh, do you pl have a niyyah to come next week? <laughs> huh? You have the niyyah? Okay, so if you have the niyyah, you'll get it, inshallah. So we'll go with the closer people. This is the... Yes? No, no. Washing the inner part of your eyes, your nose, or your mouth is not, is not part of ghsilu wujuhakum. Wuju, external parts, not the inner parts. So, so rinsing your or washing your mouth is part of the sunan that we'll talk about next week, inshallah. Yes. I don't know how good my Arabic is, but regard to imsahu al it didn't say with water, it just said imsahu al while imsahu biru may indicate that it has something to do with the water, the use of water. Some was using something because imsah, this is imsah, right? Right, it's dry, but may indicate that there's something being used to wipe off your head. So, uh, are you referring to any opinion, particular fiqh yeah, opinion? Just, 
No, uh, because al wudu itself is ibadah ma'iyya. The the fuqaha said al wudu ta'rif. The definition of wudu it's ibadah ma'iyya. It's a watery act of worship that has to do with water. So so the whole context is talking about this. And then then the same ayah, if you look at the context, it says, but if you don't find water, then use dry the the the, the tayammum, the the dirt. Right? So it's all about water. So imsahu in this igsilu igsilu imsahu, um, it, it has to do with what is understood. It's called fahwa al kalam. Fahwa al kalam or dilalat al ishara. So it's, it's very difficult for anyone who has anything to do with fiqh to think that why your head um, that with your dry hand, for example. So, so it's, it's, it's understood. So in Arabic or any text, there's al-madkur or mahdhuf. Something is not mentioned, but it's understood. We don't have to repeat it. We don't have to say it, right? So um, it, it's, it, no one ever debated this. Now, um, if you do the ghusl, do you still need to do anything? Next time, when we talk about the ghusl, uh, you guys want to get everything in one sitting. Yes? It's not obligatory. It's not obligatory, no. We'll talk about it also next time, yes. Yes, this is because, this is a good point, because uh, the ulama uh, again said, if someone has a thick uh, beard, is it enough to wash the face and and the water also? Uh, the, the 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 wash includes the uh, the the hair, not the skin. According to Abu Hanifa, yes, especially those who have very long beards, it doesn't have to uh, get the water um, through to touch or to reach his skin, right? But they said if the beard is not that thick, then he has to make sure that the water touched the skin itself, you know? So, so again, different, different views on this. So if you don't have a thick uh, beard, then make sure that when you make wudu, you get one extra handful of water and make sure that it goes through the hair to touch the skin itself. That's why some people, they take it very seriously and they, they, they make sure that, that goes everywhere. Touch the khlil, yeah. To touch the, the, the skin. Yes. Now. A couple of questions. Just so I understand the mm -hmm. So let's just say, for example, you were outside, you came home, you took a shower, there's no intention of the do whatsoever. And then you went and then it was part of Salah. So you think? According to Abu Hanifa, that's sufficient. They can do Salah with this. According to Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad, Imam Shafi, no. You have to have an intention. And the Ra'i of Hanifa in this case is accepted by the Jumur of the ulama? No, I just said that the others disagree on them. Oh, no. So, <laughs> so they disagreed with that. And this is not to say that Abu Hanifa did not say the intention is important. He said it's highly recommended to have the intention. But if it happens that you uh, dipped in your swimming pool and came out, that's halas, that's good enough. That's sunnah, yeah? If you wash your face one time, we'll talk about this, yeah? So anything that I did not mention today, <laughs> most likely I'll mention next week. So do it three times. Yeah, we have been told when we were young, you had to do it this way. Nobody told us, and I, I intentionally separate between the obligatory act and the nafl act. This is not to encourage you to leave the sunnah act, but just to be able to separate between nafl and fard, which is, by the way, one of the maqasid, if you, if you look at how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi teaches the Sahaba, um, the fara'id, he makes it very clear. Do not mix the fard with nafl. This is very clear in the example of Ramadan, the beginning of the month and the end of the month. You don't want to mix the fard with nafl. Don't fast the day when there's doubt. It is the last day of Sha'ban or the first day of Ramadan. Don't fast this because some to you and I know that some people are oh, just just in case. No, 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 no. Because this just in case, another generation will come another day just in case. And that's why it's haram to fast on the day of Eid. 
just to separate the fard from naf. This is what Allah wants you as, as a wajib. If you want to do more, fine. But it happens before that for Christians they fast 50 days. It was originally 30. But one of the kings, he said that if Allah um, cured my son, I will fast 10 more days. So he fasted and everybody else fasted these 10 days and became part of the religion. It's called bid'ah, adding something to So Rasulullah sallallahu and that's why he did not want to pray taraweeh. He wanted to separate between the fard and the nafl. Um, it's disliked for someone to pray fard and stand up to pray nafl immediately right after. You have to make some sort of separation. Go and pray somewhere else. Or wait a little bit to separate between fard. That's why you see some people sometimes they pray fard and then they go pray nafl somewhere else. Maybe many of them don't know why, but this used to do this. The point is, this is the fard. If you want to stop here, fine. Because people are different. Some people want to make every sunnah. They are able to do this. And some people that barely became Muslim, alhamdulillah, they are praying. If you give them all this sunnah together and all these details of the opinions, that would be so tough on them. Right? So, <clears throat> separating farad from nafl is important. It's, it's important. That's why we'll talk about nawafil next time, inshallah. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to okay, kind of phrase this question properly. We have so many schools of thoughts, mm -hmm. so many opinions. What does a common, simple person do when he's doing the wudu? Or so that doubts are not created in his mind, and he makes sure that he is doing the right thing. That's all. Okay, so that's a, a fair question. What a simple person needs to do in order to not to have any doubt in his mind. F first of all, um, it's always good to expand and increase our knowledge, to be aware of what are the opinions there. Number two, we need to understand that none of these opinions reflect the will of God 100%. What we know, because fiqh is about searching for the will of God. We don't know. We do not know. What we know, we all agree upon. We all know what Allah made it clear. That's what Allah made it clear for us. Okay, this part of the will of God, we know. That's why you don't have to be a faqih to know that, right? Any layman read this, okay, Allah, I know that Allah wants me to take care of these four things, right? Now, when it comes to wiping the head, we don't know exactly the will of God. Does Allah really want us to wipe all of it or part of it? So if you do part of it according to Imam Shafi'i, according to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, that's, that's not valid. That's not wudu. Your wudu is not complete. Therefore, this is a dangerous part. Therefore, if you are an Imam who are Shafi'i and we are all Hanbalis, we cannot pray behind you. Why? Because you're wudu is invalid and therefore your salah is not valid and therefore if I pray behind you my we keep building all these things because of the um, lack of tolerance and lack of understanding Imam Shafi'i when he went to Iraq to see the students he, he did not meet Imam Abu Hanifa face to face but he met his students Muhammad, Muhammad Hassan al-Shaybani and Abu Yusuf but he went there he used to pray with her for him sorry uh, um, Fajr Salah, the second rakah, every, every morning. If you go in Egypt, in any masjid in Egypt, pray Fajr there, you will find the Imam after the Rukuah, Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt, Ameen. Everybody, you know the dua we do in winter? We do this every day in Fajr, and he considers this to be part, it's Sunnah, to do this, and the Imam does it, and everybody says Ameen, and raise their hand. And this. I remember one day, a Maliki uh, Imam in Egypt, uh, half is an uh, uh, amazing person, very knowledgeable, but he's Maliki and he doesn't consider this to be Sunnah. Um, and a very simple guy came to pray, and this Imam does not do this after in the, in the second rak'ah after Rukuah. And this man is a simple man, why haram alaik? Why are not this? I'm coming specially for this dua. <laughs> And he kept screaming and shouting, Why is that? What kind of prayer is this? You deprived us from this beautiful dua. We want to make this dua, man. Why don't you do it? 
this man is very knowledgeable and he's maliki and this guy he's just very emotional he likes this dua but he sees this person is not making it and I remember also very well that's very funny okay. in Dex Masjid in Dearborn our Shafi's and Zaydis almost the same and they, they considered this uh, the Shafi's considered this Sunnah the other madhahib they said yes there are Dalil there are Hadith the Rasulullah did that but this is only in the time of Nawazil Nawazil means crisis like the crisis happening in Syria now when there's a really war going on the Rasulullah used to do this in every Salah not in Fajr only in every salah, for, for, for a month, he used to do this for the tribes that killed his companions. He sent them to teach people Quran and things. He sent the best, Quran, Hafad. And these people invited them, asked Rasulullah to send them, they killed them. And Rasulullah for a month, in every salah, not only in Fajr. So th the opinion here is that yes, this hadith, what to understand from it is that when there is a nawazil or crisis, then you can do this in every salah, not only in Fajr. According to Imam al-Shafi'i, he said, no, there are a number of hadith that say that Rasulullah used to do this in Salat al-Fajr, so it's in Nasr. In Dearborn Masjid, I was an imam there, or the imam there. And someone asked me, I was explaining to him, and this guy, that like Salafi, Hanbali, Saudi, kind of, and he said, no. And these simple guys, Shafi'i guys, they, they said, um, because sometimes he leads the Salah, Salat al-Fajr, they don't make this dua. So we're talking about this, and they said the point, no, this dua only to be made when there are crises. And this simple guy said, Wallahi, you are the biggest crisis that came to this one. <laughs> and that's why we need to make this dua. <laughs> that was funny. So um, you, the, the, the bottom line here is that that for for again for the layman it, who does not really follow any particular madhab, he should or she should follow the opinion of his local imam and goes with it. So to wrap up what we said, the four things all madhab agree upon that we must do. Right? The niyyah, I believe, I believe the opinion of Imam Malik and Imam Shafi'i that niyyah is obligatory is a very, very strong the argument itself. Because the hadith of Rasulullah, deeds are by intention. So I really believe that the argument of Imam Shafi'i and Imam Ahmad and Imam Malik, these three they said it's, it's part of, of, of the wudu itself. So if you don't have niyyah, then this does not count as wudu. Um, so in rare circumstances, if you really you, like you took the shower and you thought you are wudu and you came to the masjid and Imam is giving the khutbah and, and khalas, it's time and I remembered, oh my God, I didn't have any. In these exceptions, become Hanafi and pray, inshallah your ibadah will be accepted. But in a regular basis, you should have the niyyah in, in your in your wudu before your wudu. Um, the, the process of wudu itself, mentally, you know you're making a move. No, but but the example that he gave that if you are taking a shower, you took a sh full shower, or you in the hot summer in the hot summer you go and just yeah, I mean. The, really, the w w because we are used to do so, when you, even when you go just to cool yourself down, you find yourself washing your face and your <laughs> hand, you do all these things. So if, if, you, if you did, I, I'm, what I'm saying here is that only in some difficult situations, we can take the rukhsa of Imam Malik. Because in the end of the day, what does Allah want us to do? Two schools of thought, okay? One said, it's called Musawwibah, correctionists they consider every opinion is valid so if you follow any one of them you are fine because the hukm of Allah the ruling of Allah the will of Allah is what the qualified jurist reach the conclusion so the hukm this hukm and this all of them are the will of Allah uh, the other school of thought uh, they think or oh, called al-mukhattiya 
uh, they say that no, there's only one that's right and others are wrong. But those who are wrong, they will be rewarded for their ijtihad and for their effort. But the question is, which one is the right one? We don't know. So theoretically, it doesn't matter. Because we don't know. In the Day of Judgment, we'll know. But we don't know which one is right. Wiping part of the head or all of it. When it comes to wiping the head, for example, I find the the, the, the argument of Imam Shafi'i very reasonable, that if Allah wants us to wipe all of it, we would have done it. But I also find the other arguments very strong, because the Rasulullah continuously, he wiped, and he's the practical example of that reflects the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if the fact that he did not wipe part of his head, he always part all of it, this actually makes the other opinion stronger, that wiping, wiping the entire head is fart. So what if someone again he missed part of his head? Uh, it's always good to do all of it. But if you miss it once or or you know you found out that part of your head is not touched by the water, that's not a big deal, but keep the, the, the normal practice of of, of um, wiping all of it. Okay. Maybe you can talk next time or the difference between washing masa and wiping. Masah is wiping the same. So masah is just to get your hand wet and yeah. do like this. This is masah. But the ghasl, do you have a glass of water? Ghasl is to pour water in it and, and wash it. Okay. So when you make wudu, when you lit the water comes on your, or if you have like a container and you have to wash your hands. So you get the water and pour the water like this and do it. This is called ghasl. But masah is just to put your hand inside the pot and get your hand out and wipe on your head like this. So the difference is the amount of water. Masah, just get your hand wet. The, some water in your hand, that's enough for masah. But the ghasl is take the water and, and, and wash it your face. So if you get your hand wet and put it on your face like this, that's called masah, right? That does not count. That has to be ghasl. You see? Because Allah said, اغسلوا وجوهكم. So, ghasl, you have to get water like this and boom, wash your face. Could you consider that if you just do that? is not with water. Tayammum has to be with dirt or sand. So, it's either water or, 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 or dirt. Alright? Any questions? Yes. It not, I didn't say it's not important. I said it's not obligatory. But, but this call it Sunnah Mu'akkada because Rasulullah did it all the time. So in other words, the difference is if you change the order, your wudu is still valid. But you, are, you have done something that's not, it's not liked. But still your wudu is okay. You can, you can pray with this, yes. This is, that's why, because when we teach people how to make wudu, we tell them that. But I'm giving you a secret now. <laughs> All right? Because when, when we were young and we were taught how to make wudu, nobody told us you, have, you can make it one time only. No, they told us you have to do it three times. And they told us you have to start with the right. But when we grew up, when we read and we studied, we found out this is a good thing to do. I'm not saying that you should change the order. Okay, what I'm saying here is we are talking about the obligatory acts. So your, the, the, question, the difference is, according to Hanafi, your wudu is still valid if you change the order. But you have done something that, that you should not do, right? It's all theoretical it, be, because they read the ayah and they said, well, what? To understand Abu Hanifa, basically, I'll just give you one, one important thing that to help you understand how Abu Hanifa thinks. Because it's called methodology. So in his methodology, the textual ruling, or ahkam and nasiyah, come to us through two ways. One is very authentic, when there's no doubt it's authentic. And sometimes the, the hadith um, 
there are two kinds of hadith. There's a huge science of hadith. But just to understand how Abu Hanifa thinks, or other scholars as well, there are two kinds of hadith. Hadith, either mutawatir or ahad. Mutawatir or ahad. Ahad is the plural of ahad or wahd. Wahd, wahd means one. Ahad means ones. Okay? So mutawatir means that came to us through great number of people in each chain, in each um, uh, link of the chain. Huh? It's not only complete, it's complete, but the number of those who narrated this hadith are huge. How huge is huge? Is it more than 10. So if an imam came here and he gave a khutbah, made very clear statement, and every, how many people here, like 500 people? So 500 people listen to this khutbah and they got it, right? So when you meet 10 of your friends, they are not really related to each other. And all of them told you, you know, the Imam today said so and so. A male and female, a close friend, far friend, someone who is regular, to them, someone who is. All of them said the same thing. This means that it's impossible for all these 15 people to lie or to agree, let's lie to you, right? It's impossible, right? So that's to you means that it's tawatr, the mutawatr. Or when you are out of town and you came back and you say, you know what, who gave the khutbah at IGD last Friday? It was Sheikh Hamza Yusuf came here. Oh, really? Yeah. And then you see another Muslim, so oh, you know what? And, and now we find 20, 30 people told you the same thing. So it's impossible all these people are lying. There's no reason for them to lie. And they don't know each other. So I would believe them. I would take this as certain. It is certain. Last Friday, Hamza Yusuf gave and gave a khutbah. Right? Okay, so what if two people told you? Still, it's not as authentic as 15. Similarly, if you apply this analogy to the hadith. So the hadith that comes to us, some of them, and the very, very small uh, minority, came us through this tawatr. It's not one sahabi. Rasulullah gave a khutbah. And hundreds of people heard. Okay, so this hadith that comes, like 100 people heard it, and this 100 they passed it to 1,000, and this 1,000 passed it to 10,000, and until Trisha Bukhari, everybody knows about this, right? So there's no doubt Rasulullah said this. So this is treated like the Qur'an, because Qur'an came to us through this way, by the way, right? It's not few individuals who said this is the Surah Al-Baqarah, no. It's, it's a huge amount of Sahaba, a huge amount of Tabi'een, and so on. So this way of transmitting the, 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 the news or the text is certain that gives you certainty all right so when rasulullah says um, this one of the mutawatir hadith what's less than mutawatir little less is called mashhur and abu hanifa accept the mashhur as mashhur means it's famous it's well known it did not reach the level of mutawatir but he considered mutawatir and mashhur as one thing. Okay. Less than this is called ahad. Ahad means it came to us through a chain of narration. In each link of this chain is three, four, maybe three of the sons. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi was with Abdullah ibn Abbas alone. Um, and or the second generation or the third generation, there is one person or two per people or three people only. So this does not have the same level of authenticity as the mutawatir. So Abu Hanifa separated between these two things. So he said Quran, a mutawatir hadith, a mashur hadith that gives certainty. So when the hadith comes to us or the Quran tells us something, I will consider this to be fard. Fard means the highest level of obligation. So what if the hadith is authentic, it's in Bukhari and Muslim, although he came before Bukhari and Muslim, to us, is authentic, right? But it did not reach the level of mutawat for hadith. So the level of certainty is different. So he said, well, if Rasulullah said, don't wear silk and for men and don't wear gold. We know it's haram, right? But is it in the Quran? No. Is it in the mutawatir hadith? No. Is it a mashhur hadith? No. It is a hadith, yes, it's a hadith. 
Well, I will not say it's haram because haram only if it comes from Quran, mutawatir, mashhur. But if it comes from a hadith that's authentic, but a had, I will make another category that's below fard. I'd call it makruh. Makruh kara tahrimi. Makruh tahrimi means it is all, you will be punished if you do still. So what's the difference between this and what should know? The difference is the way it came to us. I will, I will not make equal drinking wine and wearing gold. Both are prohibited, but this is prohibited through the Quran. Quran said this. And Rasulullah said it in the Mutawatir hadith. This is haram. But wearing silk or gold for men, it's, it is, you'll be punished if you do still, but I will call this makruh kara tahrimi. Similarly, when it comes to the fard and wajib, the fard is like five, praying five times a day. Witr, how about witr? Yeah, witr came to us, many a hadith, but none of them reached the level of mutawatir. So then I will give it a different category that less than fard. That's why fard and wajib in Shafi'i is the same. You say fard or wajib, they are the same, they are synonymous. But in Hanafi, no. Wajib is less than fard. Witr is wajib. Five daily prayers are fard because of this reason. So now, what is the consequences for this? Tremendous. One of which is the particularization of the general ruling. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, pray on time, right? The Quran says that. In the Can the Ahad, a hadith, make some exception to this general ruling of the Quran? No. Because it's less. And the less cannot control the stronger. It doesn't work this way for Abu Hanif. So you have to pray on time. So I'm traveling. Can I pray the and ask together? No. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We cannot shorten the prayer or combine the prayer also, according to Abu Hanif. Why? There are many hadith. Oh, there are, it's true, there are many hadith, but none of them reach the level of authentic. So, the weaker cannot control the stronger. Right? So, when we talk about wiping on the socks next week, this is per another perfect example. Abu Hanifa says, no. Allah said, wash. To change this, which is very authentic, by a hadith that's a had doesn't work so the stronger con controls the weaker and the weaker does not overrule or give some exception to the stronger this is how he thinks this is how he thinks that's why if there's any ac accusation to imam hanif and his methodology from any other madhab it would be this one you know the very famous accusation or criticism against abu hanifa is that he ignored the sunnah whether it's right or not, but this is the historically. Oh, Abu Hanifa, the one who ignored the Sunnah of the Prophet. No, don't listen to this. So he's accused of ignoring the Sunnah, but he did not ignore the Sunnah. He said, "No, I'm not ignoring." Do you think I'm Christian or a Jew? He said, "Give me an authentic hadith. It's as authentic as the Quran. Then this will give an exception." In the same way, but but if the Quran here and the hadith is here, this one cannot overrule this or control this. They're not in the same level. Everybody does, but to him, to know his point of view, you need to know the other example or the other methodology. The other methodology said, no, the sunnah is also a form of revelation. Allah speaks to us through the Quran and he speaks to us through the mouth of the Prophet. So if Allah said, um, pray on time, right? And the Prophet ﷺ did combine the prayer in his traveling. What's wrong with that? Abu Hanifa said, no, it's not the same level. Well, it's not at the same level, but it's authentic. At least it's authentic. Yeah, it does not give you 100% certainty, but if you have 15 hadith in 15 different occasions, all of them say the same thing, and all of them are authentic, why would you ignore all this bunch of hadith? All of these hadith together, it's not one or two or three, a bunch of ahadith. Yes, none of them individually reach the level of mutawatir, but if you combine all these ahadith together, isn't it enough for you? So I said, no, it's not enough. I will go with the most authentic.
Imam Ahmad, for example, or Imam Malik, so no, if the hadith is sahih, this is my madhab. If the hadith is sahih, it can particularize the general ruling. In other words, can give some exception to the ruling, the general ruling. The Sunnah has the authority to do that. Abu Hanifa said, no. The Ahad Ahadith does not have the authority to give exception to what's mentioned generally in the Quran. Either another Quran comes to abrogate even, not only to give to abrogate, to replace this ruling with another ruling, fine, because the same level. Or the Mutawatir Hadith, it's also the same level. Other than this, no, did not do that. So this is how he thinks. So many of these rulings will come out of this. As a result of this methodological approach, the outcome will be affected with this. Um, the other ulama, they have different methodology. They, 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 they think that the sunnah can, if it's authentic, particularize the general hadith. Especially if you see a number of the sahaba who lived with the Prophet وسلم, they did and said that. Imam Malik added another methodology. It's very unique, Malik. Very unique. He says the Amal Ahl Madina, the Urf, the custom of the people of Medina until the death of Uthman, that's Hujjah. That's hujjah. That's the dalil. So if this is an unauthentic hadith, hadith is there, but it's not that authentic. That contradicts with the tradition of the people of Medina. He said, no, the tradition of the people of Medina gives me more certainty than this non-authentic hadith. So does this mean that he ignored the sunnah? No, he does not ignore the sunnah. He found another way through which he can reach the sunnah. So he said the action, the tradition of the people of Medina, you'll be really surprised to know that, that Imam Malik, for example, said that six, fa fasting six days after Ramadan, that's, that's not sunnah. No, don't do that. Why? The people of Medina never It could be a big surprise for us. But the hadith is there, yeah, the hadith is there, but it contradicts with the tradition of the people of Medina. So, there's no point to fast these six days. So what, what do we do with this hadith? Well, hadith does not give certainty. But the action of the people of Medina, to him, gives him more certainty. And he's the Imam of Medina. And who met many of the, the Sahaba, and some of the Sahaba and Tabi'een. So they, 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 they prioritize their evidence. This is the strongest evidence. This is the second strongest. This is the third. If this contradicts with this, I will go with this. That's why the outcome differs. That's why it's important for the students of knowledge to start with usul al-fiqh, not the fiqh itself. With Islamic jurisprudence, before they start the substantive law or the fiqh, uh, fiqh the detail. The, because these details came from somewhere. So when the Imam teaches you that this is how you make, you make wudu, it doesn't have to explain to you the methodology of Abu Hanifa. Just you go and do it, that's it. Right? So not every faqih is usuli. It's not, not everyone who knows the details necessarily knows the methodology. That's what we call usul al-fiqh. I hope that, that this point is, is clear and, and helpful. Just one term here. You mentioned uh, the tawatir that's coming from the number of people. Great number of people, yes. Great number of people. Great number of people, yes. And the authenticity is coming from the narrator and the link. Uh, the, uh, the definition of the authentic hadith, again, not every authentic hadith is mutawatir. Every mutawatir is authentic, but not every authentic is necessarily mutawatir. So the definition of the authentic hadith, hadith sahih, called sahih, is ma rawahu al adl al dabitu an mithlihi ila muntahahu min ghayri shuduthin wala illa. Yani, what has been narrated by a person who is adl, adl means trustworthy. Babit means that it has sharp memory from someone like him all the way to the Prophet وسلم, without having any shudud or illa. These are two terms that mean shudud means that if, if this hadith does not contradict with another hadith that's more authentic than it, or illa, there's something wrong with this chain of narration that the faqih can find. So, so if, if group of people narrated this hadith from another group of people and all of these people are authentic and trustworthy and sharp then this hadith is authentic even if 
the number is not as great as the case of, of Mutawatir. So the ulama agree, all of them agree that this kind of hadith is still authentic, but it does not give us 100% certainty this is exactly what Rasulullah said. Because still, are humans. Right? Whereas the Quran, we don't have this doubt. We know this Qulu Allah Ahad, it's what Allah said, what Rasulullah read, this is exactly what it is. We have no doubt in this. Right? So every mutawatir is authentic, but not every authentic is mutawatir. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika nashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka natubu ilayk. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim al-Asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr illa al-lazina amanu wa amanu al-salihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haqq wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Subhanak Rabbika Rabbil Izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-Muslimin. Alhamdulillah.